diploma and we just don't quite have that special type of accent and so I love hearing it. <laughs> For just briefly, could we talk about voice? Who in this room on this incredible day likes to exercise their wo voice? Can you give me a holla? Excellent. How lyrical. That's beautiful. So that sort of is like a metaphorical call, I think, to how fantastic Ted Women has been, right? And how fantastic it is going to be. It's celebratory. It's like, quote, ahala. It's exercising your voice. And so it's fantastic to be here all together. The word that comes to mind is victory, right? Regarding Ted Women today and tomorrow. I think we are at a point where there's an incredible intersection of victories, right? We're seeing the merit of Ted Stage winning. We're seeing the fantastic way that women build off of their ideas winning. And we're flat out hearing some incredible stories and journeys by women, and that is winning. It's inspiring some goosebumps. I, I need to take ownership on something quickly, whenever they first announced Ted Women, you know, many moons ago, I didn't quite know how to respond. On the one hand, it is, boom, mm, how great, look at the type of traction we're getting and the type of impact, or the type of focus that our impact is getting. But then on the other hand, I was like, well, we make up what? 85%, we are 85% of the consumer purchasing power, or we make 85% of the consumer purchasing decisions. We, and this is just a snapshot of stats, we also really impact Fortune 500. The top Fortune 500 companies who promote women show much more profit than their industry norms. So I kind of pulled back and I thought, why not TED leadership? Why not TED influence? Why do we have to bring in gender? So I mulled it over and then it crystallized. It's the byproduct of speaking in public and sharing your ideas and that's the game changer. See, it's not just, oh, here's our would-be screen. It's not just the awesome ideas that they've been sharing today and will share tomorrow, right? It's our response to that through conversation and how communities start building around the conversations and thus the ideas themselves. And that is one powerful endeavor. And I love how public speaking just goes hand in hand with conversation. You know, when you talk about women, and you talk about conversation, and you talk about community, you know, it's inevitable, frankly, that social media comes up. And so we might as well talk about how we have influence there, too. And again, just a snapshot of stats that many of you may know. We comprise roughly, you know, 60% of Facebook and Twitter users, and 23 million women weekly comment on a blog, publish on a blog, or read blogs. So, even though certainly there's a breadth of stats that we can talk about, what I want to briefly focus on is, hey, look at the type of relational capital and look at the type of influence that we are building online. And so, again, I'm going to pull back, not too far, <laughs> and take a look at a story that's really on a personal level. And looking at communities of women, and looking at my life and strong conversations and digital tech, I have to say I've learned a whole heck of a lot in the last five years. And I could never have foreseen consciously on where digital technology was going to influence my business and my hope for the future. You know how it takes a while for things to hurtly. So what I want to do is share a journey with you that covers a little bit of a miserable job, a great Toastmasters club, being just 
fascinated by visual technology. There's going to be a quick stop at the Democratic National Convention 08. And all of this covers or includes two things. It's in the context of what I was learning about public speaking. And also, throughout all of this, it has taught me something that I believe down in my toenails. And that is conversations through social media make a natural training ground to speak in public. All right, so looking briefly at the Iggy job, it was Iggy, but the positive part of it was that I was involved with a wonderful dynamic Toastmasters club. And at the time, I associated learning to public speak, public speak, speak in public, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> to speak in public, I associated that with you know, an icky job. I didn't necessarily see how that skill could be applied elsewhere. But there's a conversation surrounding that that I want to share. It was, it's the, the first of the three conversations in this arc of the journey. It was a great woman, super savvy smart, who was in the Toastmasters Club, and she was, this is a problem, pro I promise I'm not so addicted. <laughs> <laughs> and she was preparing for her Toastmasters speech. And there was also a Q&A set for her and the audience. And I said, hey, so what type of questions do you anticipate from the audience? And she said, oh no. I cancel the Q&A. I don't want to open myself up to that type of criticism or potential criticism. And I thought, huh, just kind of, I kind of sat with it. And I thought, it seems like there's a lost opportunity there that I didn't really further process. So after that, you know, I'm leaving the Italy job. I think that I'm going into something completely different, which is social technology, especially video and audio content. But I'm telling you, as I learned more about digital tech and experienced social networking, I learned that because of all the fantastic layered and accessible conversations through social media, I learned just how much relationship there is between that and, I believe, speaking in public. You know what? And at this time, I really got an itch for video. And you know, and all of this is much more familiar now, but back then, you know, it was before really Google bought YouTube, and the thought of really engaging with people eyeball to eyeball, excuse me, eyeball to eyeball through video was just incredible. And oddly, I think, and me oddly, uh, the TED Talks, the awesome TED Talks, were just then being published as well, like early 2007-ish. I saw some of the TED Talks and I thought, wow, only really savvy storytellers can share their ideas online through video. You know, I ain't so savvy. But upon reflection, learning more and learning more and learning more about the video and about the audio indicated to me so clearly that, you know, TED Talks unintentionally created like this awesome metaphor for what was, a, what was happening on the web at that time. It was like everyone, so many people, were using videos, these tools, and creating their own conversational archives, and they were spreading their own ideas. And it didn't matter if it wasn't like, you know, the official TED Talk. I just thought that was a great metaphorical type of experience. But there was something that I really learned about conversations that, again, might be old hat right now. But then it was like, wow, this is how a community expands around conversation. And that was how conversations are so portable and how they are not finite but it, in regard to time. Like you have a conversation, you might make a podcast, and you might hear it two days later because your RSS feed is backed up. And then at that point, you respond by a video, or you respond by a, by a audio, or you respond by your networks. And that conversation keeps on going, whether it's you know, by a social networking or certainly the content itself. 
and something that can just drone this home, transporting us quickly to the DNC 08. I was blogging the convention at that time, and the adrenaline was at a fever pitch. I don't think anyone slept more than two hours for the whole thing. And I saw an elevator, this is kind of embarrassing, you think someone would calm down and not sprint, but I ran for it. And I was running for an elevator that was closing, made it in. There were enough people to populate a small country in that elevator. We were all bloggers, we were, you know, holding a door, crunched like this. And I looked over, and one of our great Ted Women speakers, Ariana Huffington, was in the corner in her gorgeous suit, and she was surrounded by folks, well, we all were, but she was having a very intense conversation. And I thought, wow, do, do you think what, what would happen if I just kind of extended this and said, can you talk into my, can we do an audio cast? And then I thought that would be um, beyond rude. And so I let that go. We decompressed like sardines out of the elevator, and I did just an independent reflection type of podcast. Hey, this is what just happened, and I did not ask Ariana, you know, how her date was going. <laughs> and three hours later, a neat reporter from the Baltimore Sun and I were talking 90 miles a minute. We were listening, but at the same time, we literally were going, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this is so this type of content that I met, and wow, yeah, I met Obama's sisters too, and, and it was just intense. And then there was a pause, and he said, you know, and I heard this really quirky lady on an audio podcast. She was in a stupid elevator with Ariana Huffington, <laughs> and she didn't stupid ask for the stupid interview. And I said, well, that stupid was me. Do you want to talk about more and debate the issue? And so <laughs> this is all to say conversations are and were portable, and discovering that was just intoxicating. So bringing this back to this particular journey that we're on. I want to quickly oh, talk about DC media makers, and that leads into the second of the three pivotal conversations. So I met some fantastic video bloggers that just a while ago that just moved down from Boston, and they said, hey, let's start a digital literacy group that truly promotes you know, digital literacy in DC, and all we want to do is learn the tech in a casual environment. Great. And I was usually the only woman. But as our community gelled, I thought, hey, what would it be like to start like an informal speaker series and invite you know, fantastic folks working on digital projects, including you know, expanding the opportunities for women to speak. So with that in my mind, you know, we just start you know, networking, networking. And I was networking in DC, and with me, these fantastic women, as I'm sure we all have, would meet these fantastic women who would be on their game, they're talking about their projects fearlessly. We would do a little bit of mobile blogging, audio interviewing, video interviewing. The conversations would continue online. They're representing their expertise. And I would toss out the question, hey, would you want to present at DC Media Makers? We're really conversational. We'd really like to learn about digital tech. And certainly, certainly, many would say, you bet. However, of the arc of individuals, men and women, that I would invite, and Jamie spoke to this a little bit, women, some women, never men, would say, huh, chill, I, I don't know if I'm expert enough. And frankly, I would know that they were expert enough, not that I'm you know, perfect, but when you have game, you know, and the people would have game, and or these women would, and then they would say, you know, I just, I, I just don't know if I can speak in public like that. And so I just let that sit on my shoulder, and I thought it was strange because they would certainly lead conversations with Triumph online and in other areas. So, oh great. So that is sort of the backdrop to the second really pivotal conversation. I met with a fantastic, two fantastic people, Alice K Allison Cavis, who founded Women Through Tech, and Shereen Mitchell, who does some stunning work in technology and bridging, bridging the digital divide. As we were talking about various different things, the issue of women in tech being represented as speakers, 
at major industry conferences came up. And certainly, certainly, there are a lot of reasons on why that inequity, that unequal representation would occur. And that's fodder for another talk and more exploration. But what really stood out that started you know, resonating past experiences and past conversations was their observation, they've been in technology a lot longer than I have, but it was their observation that a lot of women that they thought should have major ownership of their expertise and great success in leading conversations in a live, in-person dynamic like this from a stage were just not doing it because, again, of that perception issue of not perceiving themselves as an expert. And that really, the way they said it, just really resonated with me in this conversation really sat with me a lot and I started really thinking, huh, I remember that experience with Toastmasters. I remember, remember you know, positive experiences with sales training and you know, being fascinated with the sound of people's voices and other conversations and digital tech. And I thought, you know, is there something I can do? And then, you know, have that, have that mental volley with yourself. Do I do something? Do I not? Do I do something? Do I not? But something was important and I just hadn't seen it clearly enough yet. So I left that conversation and I'm walking home. And I remember, you know, Allison and Shereen, you know, underscoring, hey, a lot of these women who don't want to engage in person to, a, you know, a stage-centric audience like this do engage and debate heavily and defend their ideas and have, you know, pretty vulnerable conversations online. Vulnerable as in, there's a lot of criticism and they feel that with grace and strength, but not offline. So I was really thinking and then I thought, I thought this question must, must the confidence gap between engaging in online, you know, social media conversations be so wide and vast from the confidence that we lack in engaging in public. And I was thinking, surely there must be a way. I wonder if I can do something. I wonder if I can do something. And then, I just thought something was possible. And frankly, I want to clarify, in case you're concerned that I've completely lost my rocker. When, or off my rocker. Oh, Whenever thinking of cultivating public speaking skill, in no way am I you know, leading up to the idea that engaging on the social web will just replace any offline development that we need to do as speakers. That's not what I'm simulating at all, because nothing replaces this great you know, in-person, irreplaceable you know, conversational exchange. But what was just striking to me is we're engaging, or you know, the people I was observing and these conversations I was keeping together were a part of already engaging in a vulnerable, vulnerable dynamic. Can't we do something in a stage like in-person dynamic? So the third, third, excuse me, uh, pivotal conversation comes up, and it was soon after that, and I met with a friend who said, "Hey, Jill, can you just uh, listen to my speech a little bit?" And she had major gains in technology. She had about 5,000 square followers and certainly engaged on Facebook. And she was prolific and would also defend her ideas with eloquence and strength and clarity. And so she starts rehearsing. And she starts shaking like this. She starts. And I'm not trying to make fun of her. I'm just trying to capture the awkward, painful moment for her. And she's short, very short of breath. The tears start rolling down her face. And I had never seen that type of strain before. I, certainly, you know, managing the energy to speak in public can be difficult, but that reaction I had never seen, and so things calmed down, and I looked at her and I said, whenever you have the debates that you do, and whenever you engage in social media, social media, excuse me, the way that you do, do you ever feel vulnerable? Do you ever feel like it's a vulnerable stage? And she said, you know what, it's easier being an expert online. And I paused for a minute, and she ended up not doing the speech. She canceled it. And I paused for a minute, and then the wave of clarity hit me, and I said, 
to myself, if there is a way to help promote some sort of paradigm shift regarding the way that we lead stages online through social media and transfer some of that confidence offline, then that's what I really want to do. If there's a way to be our confident selves offline as well, or as much as we are online, then that sounds like a good deal to me. And pulling back from all of this, I want to just toss out a hypothetical. Hypothetical scenario. Imagine all of the speakers that were invited to take women. What do we learn? 70 or 80? Imagine all of them being invited, and imagine all of the TEDx communities across the globe also organizing their speakers. The invitations go out, and imagine every single woman speaker who received an invitation saying, you know what, I, I don't think I have game. I don't think my expertise is good enough, and I think I'll just update my Facebook status with a few bucks. Or I think I'll just tweet about my ideas. Even though that certainly would reach some audiences, what type of deficit would that leave the experience for our particular conversations that we're having? It would be a severe loss. There wouldn't be the eye-to-eye -eye exchange. There wouldn't be any way to have this particular moment and build communities around the ideas that they would have shared. And so, as we conclude you know, this part of our conversation tonight, I want to toss out an invitation. If and when we ever feel like we're not good enough to get on stage, a physical stage, and engage in a one to group dynamic, if we ever feel like that our expertise should be called into question, could we just stop that minute? and kind of take an audit, casual audit in general, of the conversations that we lead online, which online through social media, we can't control other people's response. There's still that element. I know there's not that type of energy. There's still a little bit of a different dynamic. But there's still the element of being on a vulnerable <coughs> stage. Can we consider that? And can we say to ourselves, you know what, I think I'll give a physical stage a try. And add that certainly to our toolkits of exercising our skill as speakers and developing our speech craft. I tell you what, I see this type of paradigm shift as a step, a gentle step, but a step toward cultivating an antidote to fear. Because our idea, excuse me, our ideas and the conversations that surround them can only take greater flight and find more allies when liberated from fear. And I will own up that maybe it's naive to make fearlessness a goal. But I don't think after looking at the arc of why I made the decision to pursue this particular business and to help particular communities of women, I don't think I care anymore. I've seen too many types of suffocation and suffocation of ideas. And so when our women and our girls look to us to help them reshape the future, could fearlessness be an idea worth spreading on any stage available? Thank you.